Everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming. This is the Beginner's Guide to Localization. So if you hadn't noticed that on the screen already, good time to bolt. Um, so I'm Kaylin. I'm a technical account manager at Lingotech. So I have been there for about a year. I've worked with a lot of different clients on a lot of different platforms. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that what I can do for you guys today is provide some general guidelines on localization, how it works, um, things to watch out for, if you pick up a new site, where to go? Do you have a question? Yeah, are you going to be posting your uh, slides to to the yes. Google site? Yes. Okay. Yeah, oh, and I can go, I can go back to if you guys want to grab my email. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I flipped through that real quick. So I have run into a lot of issues, and it's not like this is not a Lingo Tech talk. You can come ask me questions about Lingo Tech afterwards. But um, these are general things. So if you're building a new site and the client is saying, well, we don't really want to do localization now, but we will later, you know, things to keep in mind. So like I said, um, this is actually my fifth or sixth year at Florida Drupal Camp. Um, I'm not entirely sure which number that is. We have a debate going about it. Um, so long time lurker, first time presenter. Um, and like I said, I've worked with D7, D8, WordPress, Mercado, Magento, Adobe Experience Manager, Sidecore, Basically everything you can think of in the web space, I've probably had to deal with it once now. Um, some more than others, Drupal a lot more than others. So there's a lot of jargon that comes across in the localization and translation industry. So if you've seen these before, I18N, L10N, T9N, this is kind of Greek to a lot of people. It was to me when I started. So we have the alphabet soup translated for you. So T9N is an industry speak for translation. Basically what they do is they take the first letter and the last letter and they count the number of letters between the two and they shorthand it that way. So T9N, L10N is localization, so on. So translation actually only refers to translating written content from one language to another. So from a source language to a target language. Um, if you're discussing like audio transcription or like doing audio, it's interpretation, not technically translation. That's a fun little quirk. So most of what we do is translation. Localization is a term that basically means you're adapting what you're doing to the target market. So that's, it's more than just text. It's content sometimes. It's color schemes because you know red has a certain color in one culture versus another. Um, it's making sure that you're getting the right layout for your site. So if you're doing you know, a Hebrew site, you need to be going right to left instead of left to right, that kind of thing. So localization refers to just making sure that you're hitting what you need to for your target market. And internationalization is a design mentality. So um, that's basically while you're building this out, you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to be doing later? How can I make this easier for me later if I need to swap languages or if I need to do something? It's basically the ability to, when your client comes to you and says, hey, my site needs to be multilingual, you can sit there and go, OK, instead of, oh, crap. So it's that planning ahead phase. So with that, basically for like internationalization and localization, I kind of sat down, I wrote down my list of everything I wanted to talk about and started grouped it out into four main sections. So that's your site architecture, your workflow, making sure that you're paying attention to your code and your contrib, and then making sure that you're also providing a good user experience, both for front end and back end. So for site architecture, this is a biggie. Content. You know, that's what people are coming to see on your website. They want to see your content. So you have to think about this ahead of time. If you're building a site from the beginning, obviously that's the best place to start. Um, you know, when you're trying to do localization. There's a couple things that you can do to make your life easier later on. The first one, this seems really, really straightforward, but use reasonable naming conventions for your content. I have another slide that I'm going to flip to in a second, but we'll go there in a minute. So we have a client that we worked with, and they were complaining that to us that they had a lot of trouble figuring out whether or not specific content had been uploaded to the translation management system. And they were having so much trouble, they couldn't figure it out, it was difficult. And so we started kind of doing a little audit and walking through it with them. And they were like, okay, so this page, and they show it to us. And it's something about you know managed solutions. We're like, okay, well, where is this in the TMS? Like, let's find it. We can't find it either. Well, 
It's because the name of the page in Drupal was not Management Solutions, it was Steak Knife. How do you find your management solutions page if in Drupal everywhere it is referred to as steak knife? This was a technology company. They did not sell steak knives. There is no reason <laughs> that steak knife should have been a part of this website. But on the front end of the site, sure enough, you're on this page, you hover over the language selector, hover text said steak knife, public facing back end. That makes your job harder. So making sure that you have good naming conventions will help you identify what you need to do. Um, another thing that's really good, keeping your content and your layout separate. That seems like a no-brainer with Drupal. We've got panels, we've got views, we've got systems. You know, you have your template, you have your content separate. It's really easy. It is really easy sometimes when you're doing development to take that shortcut and you do some inline HTML. You do a little bit of structure. You do a div here, you do a div there. You're adding elements to your text, to your content, and that makes it more difficult later when you're trying to do your localization. Because if marketing comes and they say, hey, we want to move this block over here, but that's built into your template and the content is built into the template, makes it really hard to do that translation. Also, if you decide that you need to change your translation, if you're really tied in, if you make a change to something, on the live site and it doesn't propagate easily across um, all your other languages, it, you're just gonna be in kind of a world of hurt. So stick to that Drupal credo, keep your content and your layout separate. Don't give in to temptation, <laughs> you know, to do the easy way. Um, I did have a client come to me who had one field on her content types, the body field, and it was full of inline JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and she went, okay, we're having trouble with localization. And I went, yeah. You, you are. <laughs> this is, this is going to be a challenge. Um, so we had to redo some things. Uh, the next thing, knowing what needs to be localized in a content type. You know, if you're talking with somebody and they're saying, okay, well, we're going to be translating our URLs. Well, that means that you have to pay attention to how you handle your URLs in the site. You have to make sure that if, you know, instead of hello, you know, slash hello, slash hola, that you have an ability to manage the URLs that are linking to slash hello, so that they point to the right place. Um, same thing with like forms. If you're bringing in iframed content, you know, a lot of systems it's difficult to bring in iframed content that's translated, or to change out the iframes so that it's pulling in translated content. Um, so with the links, I kind of already talked about that, you know, if it's inline or if it's in a link field, generally, for localization and uh, future proofing, using a link field or a URL field is a better idea. Most um, technology solutions can handle that more natively. Um, other parts are the graphics and the downloads, so the other collateral other than just the text on the website. Graphics that have text built into them, you can't strip that out from Drupal. You can't just be like, hey, this picture that I uploaded that says pink fuzzy unicorns. The, Drupal doesn't know it says pink fuzzy unicorns. So you have to pay attention, you have to work with your clients, come up with a different way. Put an image there, use some divs, use some pretty fancy styling for your front end, place your text over it so that the text can be localized easily using the technology solution, rather than having to grab a Photoshop file and pay for desktop publishing to create six different versions of the image for every language that you need and then figure out how to serve the right image. Same thing with the downloads. That one's a little more tricky because a lot of times you have your gorgeous PDF that marketing made and they're just, they love it, and you gotta have it, but you have to be able to serve the proper language to people. If they're on your Spanish site, they don't wanna download an English PDF. So pay attention, plan ahead, think these things through. Steak knife again. With D7, there's also another consideration to bear in mind. Um, there's, there's two different ways to manage translation on D7. And I still talk about D7 because it's still out there. There's still D7 sites that we're supporting, D7 sites that are starting their first check in localization, so kind of good to know. Um, you can do it basically through field translation or node translation. Differences there being if you do field translation, you have one instance of the node, so there's one node ID. It just creates the different versions of each field with the lang code, and it pulls the proper language for that node when you hit it. If you do node translation, it actually creates a new node ID for each version. So if you've got Spanish, French, and English, you will have three different node IDs, one for Spanish, one for French, and one for English. 
and linking those can be a challenge at times. Um, there's reasons to do it both ways. Um, if you're doing what we refer to as like asynchronous content, so not everything that you have in your English site is going to be on your translated site or your localized site. No translation is the way to go because you can choose to remove content, basically. It's a whole new version. Um, and if you ever work with WordPress, um, WordPress actually does no translation by default. So, well, they're equivalent of no translation. It creates a new instance of the page or post um, that you have to deal with in that language. Um, and then on D8, the wonderful, wonderful, frustrating paragraphs with translation. Everyone loves paragraphs, they're great. Your users adore them. They're beautiful things. Depending on your technology solution, they are also a pain in the butt for translation. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's um, we all had a massive, massive cheer moment when we got support for paragraphs in our module. We were like, thank you, Christian, you're the best. Because everyone's using it. And so you've got basically these entity relationships and your users are coming in and they're like, well, so I've got my content and then I've got all these paragraphs, but these paragraphs are kind of linked to this, but when I'm trying to translate this main page, it's just translating the page. It's not translating my paragraphs. What do I do? And then because paragraphs don't let you give each paragraph a name, you go to look at your paragraphs management area and you see 50 versions of paragraph type card. Well, which one does it belong to? So when you are working with Drupal 8 and paragraphs in your clients, plan on spending some time developing tools for them to use to manage translation. Because if they go to the page and they can say, okay, I want to translate this page, and you give them a button on the back end, they say, translate. And it just goes and it gathers all of those entity IDs and it rolls it all up and sends it up. They're going to love you. If you don't do that, you're going to get a couple phone calls in the middle of the night with people possibly cursing. Just saying. Never. And there's no importer for it. Like, it there's a node importer, so you can, when you give, like, for translation, yeah. they will convert it to XML and give it to you. But for paragraph, there was a plugin. Like a year back. I don't know about now. Yeah, the, there, it used <laughs> In the beginning, it was difficult. I will say, you know, this is not a LingoTech sales ad, but LingoTech does support paragraphs. I'm not out there. Um, so we'll move on into workflows. So there's the two types of workflows. Obviously, there's your user workflow and there's your development workflow. Again, it seems like it should be a no-brainer that you have a standardized development practice for your team when you're working on a site. If you have multiple people, if you guys need to be able to coordinate, need version control, all these things. You would be surprised how many places don't have a standardized workflow, though. And so you kind of get in there and you're like, OK, well, we've got these questions. Where are we going to install this? Where are we going to test it? And they kind of go, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, so if you're doing localization, it's even more important because there's a couple added steps. Um, that step being needing to test your localization and translation. So basically, when you build out a site, if you're using contract modules, like particularly on D7, it's better on D8 because there's such a push in D8 for multilingual. But you need to be able to test your contract. You need to be able to test your custom code. Or if you're taking a site that already exists and you're trying to translate it, you need to be able to test what's been done and see what perhaps your company wrote, whether or not they used the T function. You know, little details. Um, so we recommend using pseudo localization which is basically the practice where you take your site in a development environment and you hook it up to a machine translation engine and you just send everything through. You're like, all right, here's my homepage. I'm signing it up for machine translation. You go, you look at it where it's localized, and you identify whether everything translated. Um, this is instantaneous, basically, once you're hooked up to machine translation. And if you use the fancy trick of using a non-Latin character-based language, like Japanese, Chinese, um, Russian, you can spot very quickly if you're still seeing English on the page, because it's a completely different character set. You know, If you have a whole page of Chinese and all of a sudden an English word, it sticks out. And then you can go through and you can grab through your project and say, where is this word coming from? Why isn't this translating for me? Um, so that step saves you so much time, saves you so much money, 
Because if you're like, okay, yep, we totally have this ready to go, you're ready for translation, you're ready for localization, you send it to your client, they take their files, they send it off for human professional translation, they get it back two or three weeks later from the translators, everything's in there, and then they go, but why isn't this button translating? Well, then you have to figure it out. Then you have to take that file, send it to the human translators, get that back. It just adds so many days to the cycle and it costs your client money every time they have to go to those uh, human translators. Um, the next thing with the, this isn't really development, but it's on the developers, um, how you plan for the new development that takes place. If they want to add a new feature, they want to add new content, they want to do something different. You have to figure out how to do your development work without impacting the live site translation. So like, in some instances, like, so with Lingotech, we use document UUIDs to kind of keep track of your translations between Drupal and Lingotech. We have had instances where someone will take a site dump from production, go back to development, and they start working, and they don't realize it, but they have the same UUIDs, and they're impacting what's happening on the production site. So we just kind of always throw it out there, like, make sure you understand how your localization and translation works, so that when you're doing dev, you don't accidentally knock out your client's translation, I don't know, say on a product launch day. Because, you know, you're launching a new product. Oh wait, we just wiped out all of your translation, that's really bad. Your marketing team is going to be very unhappy with you. The other types of workflow that you have to pay attention to are content authoring. And so like, realistically speaking, you may not be involved in the content authoring workflow, but if you're doing multilingual, it's very helpful if you can help influence in a positive manner your client's content authoring. Basically, where are they authoring this content? Are they doing it on a staging site, on a dev site? Are they doing it on production? Um, are they doing anything with like work, workbench moderation? Um, do you need to add a translation step to that workflow so that they can get things created and pushed out to the translators before it has to go live? Um, back with that ability to stage content. This is, this is a problem on a site if you don't have your content and your template separate, because if you can't put the content onto this environment, send it for translation, and then push it live once you've got the translations back, you're gonna be pushing up stuff for your English site and then all the other sites are gonna be wrong. So you really do need to pay attention to this and it's kind of an afterthought for most people because like we're not involved in the content but it's going to have a very negative impact on your users down the line. Last thing, timelines. Again, this is, this is usually something that we help with, but I you know, know that it happens that you'll be working late the night before to finish something up for that big launch the next day. We've all done it, it's okay, you can admit it. With translation, you can't really do that. Because if you're creating content or you're doing new UI or you've got template strings, you've got to send that through human translators. They're not up at two or three o'clock in the morning usually, and they don't really want to help you out with that last minute translation two hours before the site goes live. So you need to work with your team, with the content authors, with everyone, and with the translation vendor, the language services provider, to understand how much time they need to get that back to you, so that you have your deadline set properly, so that you're not accidentally screwing your client over. Because these poor language services people, you know, if the dev team takes an extra two weeks, well that's two weeks less time that they have to do their translation. And so then they get hit by the client because the translation's not delivered on time. Well, it's because the site wasn't delivered on time really. So you guys kinda, as the developers can come out of that looking pretty okay, but your language services providers are not gonna enjoy working with you, and depending on where the relationships are, it can be a problem. So just make sure that you're paying attention. So on this slide, I kind of included some general guidelines for translation so you can take guesstimates, too. If you know how much content's on the site, one translator can do 1,500 words a day. In general, the most that you would put as far as number of translators on a project is four. So you get 6,000 words translated a day. You have reviewers that review the content. They can review up to 8,000 words a day. So that's really kind of where you're at. So if you know that the site has 60,000 words on it, you're looking at 10 business days for your translation. They might, yeah. 
Sometimes when you're translating to other languages, they just require more space, more words. That is absolutely true. German, in particular, has the ability to take a two-syllable word and make it 57. <laughs> it is always German. <laughs> we, we have a, um, a native German-speaking um, project manager for our language services team. And she, every time we give her a German project, she's like, you know there's going to be problems with the website. And we're like, we know, Romina, it's okay. <laughs> Um, so that is part of it too. Once you get the translation back, you need that time to put the real translation on the website, view it in context, and say, oh, my menu can only have 30 characters on this link. You know, the, the German word that they gave me is 75. Do you have another word that we can use here, please? Or you need to make adjustments to your templates. So that's part of the timeline. Like, thank, thank you for bringing that up. I actually forgot to put that in here. So excellent question. And there's point. also cultural considerations. Things that you say in English might be offensive in another language or to exactly. direct and work for you. Exactly, and that's where you hope that you're working with a language service provider that you can trust. Um, most, not all, but most language services providers actually have native speakers doing the final translation and review. So it's not a United States citizen that learned French who is doing translation from English to French. They're using actual French, native French speakers who are translating from English to French. How do you handle, let's say for instance, Spanish from an Argentinian compared to Spanish from a Cuban? So in translation, there's the concept of the, there's, there's the general language, so that's Spanish, and then there's a locale. So you can have Spanish Spain, um, so that's the, the language code is ESES, -ES, or you can have like Spanish Latin America, which is ES419, um, and all of all of them. There's an awful lot of different target locales. So that's a decision that you get to make with your technology, how you want to handle that, um, particularly with Spanish. Mm -hmm. What I see most commonly is we kind of identify are you like an American company that's adding Spanish because you have a lot of Spanish speakers in the US, so we need to do Latin American Spanish? Or are you trying to hit a global market of Spanish, so we just do a generalized form of Spanish that's close enough? Or um, there's a client I'm working with that we actually have three different target locales of Spanish for their site because they have Dominican Republic, they have Mexico, they have the US, they have these things, so they wanted to actually really localize it specifically to those markets. Um, so, you know, I can't speak to how other places do it, but with Lingotech, you can add as many targets as you want and we work with you to do it and, and to get it done properly. Um, we, we work with Spanish speakers from Latin America or Spain or wherever it is that you're, you're talking about. Um, so back with the timeline, the, the main point that I want to make it here is like translation does take time. Not just the actual human translation part of it, but checking on it to make sure that it came back into your site and is displaying properly. Um, it takes longer than everyone thinks it does. That is the common thread everywhere. Localization takes time. So now we'll get into the, the four C's, the carefully considered code and contra. I was proud of my alliteration. So in coding for localization, there is something that I come across a lot. And I'll let you guess what it is from my slide. <laughs> Hard coding strings and template files. Don't do it. Just don't do it. I have seen this so much. Like in call to action buttons, someone will put learn more or read more. Just right there in the PHP. It's a string. It's in there. They're not wrapping it. They're not doing anything. They're just throwing the text in, because who cares, right? It's always going to say this. You don't need to change that. Except you can't translate it then. We don't translate PHP files. <coughs> so more, more often than I would like to admit, we'll be doing pseudo localization on a site, and there's a string that just keeps not translating. And I'm like, hey, did you happen to put this in a template file somewhere? And they're like, no, we didn't do that. And I'm like. I, I, could you make me feel better and just double check? <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> the string was just hanging out. So in D7, the T function, definitely your friend. With Drupal 8 and Twig files, the trans function, absolutely your friend. There's ways to do it correctly. If you can avoid it, avoid it. But if you have to, do it right. 
And really, again, the third bullet point, don't ever do it, <laughs> please. Um, now, the, the point here with the PO files, so Drupal 8 has the ability to export .po files, which is, I don't actually know what .po means, I just know it exists. Excuse me. But it's a method for handling UI translation. So it exports all of these text strings that Drupal has into a file, and then we can upload that into a translation system. Linguists can go through it, they can translate it for you, you can re-import it to Drupal. Um, because it's not really gated, it's every UI string in Drupal. So like the base export of this file is like 80,000 words, which I recently discovered can cost around $30,000 to translate. So if you can avoid doing that, that's good. Um, there's modules that help you gate what strings will download if you do need to do a lot of template translation. Um, so, so kind of pay attention for that. Um, basically, if you have a custom module or you have templates, you can say, I only download strings from this area. And it will only download strings from that area. Um, and then as your final reminder, don't hard code strings in the template files. That is my number one when I was talking to my team about things. Every person on my team said, don't hard code strings in template files. So we, we do run into that. Whoops, wrong button. I tried to use the mouse instead of the arrow keys. That wasn't a good idea. Um, the other point with Drupal is choose your contribution carefully, contrib modules. Because like it's particularly in D7, it wasn't a requirement that things could support multilingual, so it doesn't all. It just doesn't. Um, in D8, I think I recall hearing that you have to support multilingual in order to be accepted, but I don't remember that for sure, so don't quote me on that, even though it's gonna be in the video now. But support for, for localization and internationalization is really strong in D8, so you're probably okay, but the popular modules that, everyone's are, that everyone is using tend to have better support. More eyes are on it, more people are using it, it has more chances of actually having been involved in a localized site, so the bugs have been sorted out, that kind of thing. Um, custom ecosystems that people develop, you know, like a Drupal shop might have their own, like, this is what we use, this is what we like to do. They don't always have as many people using it. And if you think to how many sites your shop, if you're at a shop, have ever localized, it's probably not a huge number. So you're more apt to run into some issues. Um, so depending on the budget for the project, what's going on, you know, pay attention to what has good multilingual support and go that route. Because trying to sort out some of these issues can be pretty rough. Um, the last part is user experience. So this is both front end and back end, but mostly I'm gonna talk about the back end. You need to make translation easy for your content authors and your content administrators. Because if you don't, they're not going to want to translate the site. They're not going to want to keep up with it. It's, it can be very difficult, it can be very challenging for them. You know, they're not developers. The Drupal UI may not be intuitive to them. What we think is really straightforward might be way too many steps for them. So places, if you're not using something like Lingotech, identify places where you can create a dashboard for them to use for localization. You know, consider if you're using paragraphs, can I make a button that they can press on the edit screen if they know they're ready for translation that will go through and grab all of the paragraphs, roll it up into the parent, send it out for them so they don't have to go identify all those. Um, look at whether or not you can do a script for them to do the initial content push, particularly on large sites. I've got a client right now, their baseline site was 450,000 words. It's like 12,000 entities. Someone has to go through and push all of that for translation. So we wrote them a script because otherwise it would have taken someone a week to upload, excuse me, to upload all this. So we just set the script running overnight. They woke up in the morning, it's all translating now. Um, other things that you need to pay attention to is you know figuring out whether or not content has changed since it was last translated. Because if someone goes into the source content and they're like, oh, we had a typo. Well, you know, they'll change the typo and then it throws off sometimes what was the last save. So you need to be able to identify like, was this a big change? Was it a little change? Was it spacing? Did we add a new paragraph? You know, where are we at with this? So that the client knows whether or not they need to send it out to their translators again. Because in general, translators don't translate typos 
You know, they see that you misspelled the, they don't put a typo in the Spanish version, but you know, they understand, um, but it's still something to just kind of be aware of. So that's, that's kind of my, my baseline. Did anybody have any questions about localization or translation or processes or anything? Don't be afraid. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it, it sounds like there's, a, there's kind of a different, or a, a very big difference between like machine translations and actual human translated. Is there a, scenarios where you can combine them both? I mean, like do you, and then I guess how do yeah. those scenarios differ, um, say like the, you know, just like machine translations, like how much would that differ with, um, you know, something compared to like Google Translate, you know, right. something that has, uh, I mean. Yeah, so um, just to repeat for the recording, this question about machine translation versus human translation and when you would use both and, and how they differ. Um, so our machine translation engine, we actually use Google Translate basically and, and Microsoft. So the machine translation is basically referring to one of the two big providers there. Um, human translation is obviously using actual linguists to do your translation work. Um, the main difference between the two is, you know, the machine is taking guesses, it's using context clues, it's coming up with the best ideas, but it's not necessarily as smart as a person. There are some languages where you can get away with it pretty okay, um, like Spanish is actually really straightforward for machine translation. Um, it does a passable job. You know, there's still going to be quirks, there's still going to be issues. Um, but if you don't have the budget for human translation, it's a perfectly reasonable starting point. You know, places are going to look at it and go, like someone who's a Spanish speaker will go, yeah, you machine translated this, but I see what you're saying. There's other languages like Chinese and Japanese that you can't machine translate it. It just, you can't do it. Think about all of those really awesome, like top 20 lists of horrible signs in China that you see where they translated from Chinese to English and got it totally wrong. <laughs> you don't want to be the other side of that because they have lists too <laughs> showing the top 20 times that we tried translating to Chinese and failed. Um, so the, the machine translation can, can kind of be an issue there. So like scenarios where you can use MTs for that. Other things that's really easy if it's like data for um, like technical data, you don't necessarily want to because there's there's technical background and knowledge with that. But um, if it's like a five sentence phrase, you know, or five word phrase that's really simple, it's harder for it to screw it up. So like one of my clients right now, they have a membership system and they have offers that they put out. They're running all the offers through machine translation because they change so frequently, it's so fast, you can't wait for humans to do it, and it's usually a sentence or two at most, and the idea gets pushed through. So that's kind of where you can go with that. Sorry. How about languages like Amharic, that is African, and has like 700 characters? That, so, <laughs> I have not personally had to do a site in Amari yet. We do have at Lingotech we have a very vast and wide pool of translators and we work with other groups so that when a rare language pops up, we don't say no. Um, your biggest hurdle there is going to be cost. Because to find someone that can competently translate into Amari or some of the other rare languages, you are going to pay a premium for that because there's not a lot of translators that do it. Um, so, so realistically, at least in, in the U.S., like, we, we tend to see people hitting the major languages. You know, they're hitting French, Spanish, German, um, Chinese, Japanese, and then Portuguese. Um, Brazilian Portuguese actually is a very popular language that we hit. Um, those tend to be what people are translating into because it's the best return on investment for an enterprise-level site. Um, if you're in a, a niche market where you need that, you are probably also in an area where you might have better access to the translators and you may not want to run that through Lingotech or you know, another one of the big companies. You, know, you may have someone on your staff that can do that for you. Um, but you, you just if that's what you're gonna do, you have to know and you have to be able to support the 700 characters. You know, I, I personally, like I said, I haven't run into that yet and so I don't have first-hand experience. If you do and you'd like to share it, please do. Well, it, that's the language of Ethiopia. And okay. um, mm -hmm. I spoke to one of the people out here, and they said they had machine translation for it. Okay. So um, 
but again, you know, it, it's a a lot of times the cultural issue is also different. Yep. Because what happens is the persons there are saying, "Oh, here's another." They call him Ferengi, which is, means white guy in, in mm -hmm. Ethiopia. You know, <laughs> trying to sell me something. You know, and and if you are able to communicate in in the context of how they do things, then you are no longer a white guy. You're one of them. Right. And and so um, it's important. Also, I think that. Uh, Sometimes the cultural context is more important than actually the language. I, I would actually agree with that. That's one of the big focuses of localization. It's not just getting the language right. Machines can get the language right. We'll Even put that the in images, and you can change images mm -hmm. because I remember that on, on some of the Bible translations where it says, you know, you're white as snow, and these were, they would say, it's white as a coconut. Because mm -hmm. they don't have snow in that country. Yeah, they don't. But have they the would say white as a coconut, so they could relate to a coconut, but yep. they couldn't relate to snow. Yeah. So we we refer to things like that too. It's not just translation; it's transcreation, because you are referring to new content. You're changing the idea. Well, you're not changing the idea of what's said, but you're changing the words. So you know, I have one of my clients is a big um, chain industry that has locations in the US and Canada, in Puerto Rico, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. And so they have their baseline description of a store. But in the US, they focus on the easy parking, the spacious this, these things. When they're going into Brazil, they don't care whether you have good parking. So they're changing what the content is focused on and so that's, if you are planning on doing that, that process of quote unquote transcreation, um, that's really important to make sure your language service providers know about, and even your development teams, because um, there's a concept in translation called translation memory, which is where if you pay your translation vendors to translate the phrase like, I love cats, um, that gets saved in translation memory. So you have your source segment, and then you have your translated version of it. The next time that you upload a document, It'll go through, and if you use the phrase, I love cats, again, then it will say, oh, you've already translated this before. You liked the way that we translated it. I'm just going to take that and drop it in here. So when you start working with transcreation, you would have your source of I love cats, but if, say, you're in a country that doesn't know what a cat is, and you change the animal to I love dogs, the next time that you send this up for a different language or for a different circumstance, um, and that's actually a bad example because you'd always want to do that. But you see what I'm saying? Like your translation memory is not going to have a translation for I love cats anymore. Anytime, like if suddenly cats are introduced here and you bring this up, it's going to keep talking about the other animal. So you have to be careful with what you're doing because you don't want, parking lots are great to equal, you know, we have lots of trees because they're not the same. And so that can end up confusing people in the long term. So if you're doing the transcreation, um, definitely make sure that your language service providers and your dev teams know. So, any other questions or commentary? No? Yes? Um, with the non-Latin character languages, such as Russian, Chinese, mm -hmm. um, or any of them, uh, in your experience, how often have those forced a schema change on the database or flat out broken PHP. So I don't I don't actually know if is are, are the Chinese characters covered under UTF eight? Yes. I have not had it break my databases yet. Okay. Now and I don't know whether that's because I'm lucky and the people creating the sites knew that they were going to be translating into Chinese and so they set everything up appropriately in the beginning. You know, so they, they chose a database schema that worked. Um that, that has not been a problem that I've run into. Um, I'm pretty sure, though, since a lot of times we use Chinese for pseudo-localization, you know, we're just throwing it in a random Drupal site that hasn't had any preparation, and it's usually fine. Um, now, the Amari language, we might have issues. <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee that one. <laughs> uh, well, my, my wife's in the field, that's, that, that's okay. why I know it. I'm, I'm surprised of how much I see um, on the 
on the web because there are a lot of Ethiopians, not here in Orlando, but if you go to Washington, D.C. or mm -hmm. Seattle or Atlanta, mm -hmm. those are pretty large populations. Okay. And a mm -hmm. lot of them are technically skilled. Okay. Um, so um, uh, maybe that that is different, but I I just wonder, you know, how to how do you type that? How do you you know? <laughs> it, it, it it's amazing to me. Yeah. It's it's, it's it's crazy. You know? Yeah. I so conversions. Huh? Mean, I mean, it, it it is it is, and you know it's. Uh, but you know, there are people just like us. Oh yeah, I mean, you got mm -hmm. something that oh, you, yeah, you know. so you encounter it, you never really think about it. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. I've seen German you programmers know. copy and paste characters that are on the keyboard. Accessibility mm -hmm. class I was in, where you don't think of and, it. And it's becoming yeah. a huge yeah. issue. Yeah. Because, no, you're, you're right. Um, you get sued yeah. for accessibility yeah. out. Yeah. When Dixie just lost a huge case. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Weren't you saying like the, 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 the firm that was responsible Access also got sued too? That's uh, uh, that's, that, that's, what we wow. that's new. So well, I'll go ahead and, and close up so I can stop the recording. Um, but if you have more questions, um, Lingo Tech has a booth. We're over there. Um, my associate Christopher is there. You can find Lingo Tech Project on Drupal. Um, if you are actually you, you and your wife might find it interesting. Um, Gala is the Global and Localization Association. Um, so they're basically a giant resource on everything that you need to know about localization, but it's not just for text. They also have like the um, interpretation, translation, localization from all aspects. Like it's like the major. So Lingo Tech's a member of Gala, and we have a couple. We have one person on the board. We we work with them a lot. Um, really, really great informational resource. And then of course there's my email and Twitter. Um, you guys, feel, if you run into a problem, question, feel free to reach out and I will pay attention. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.